I was three years old when I fell in love with fire. The yellow and blue flames captured me. I dove in. Unfortunately, I wasn't badly burned, so I did it again. Later, I became an explorer. I've taken my canoe down many rivers. Each new trip adds to that first fire. This is the story of one river, one trip, on one man's journey. If I were going to start at the beginning, I'd have to go way, way back. But neither of us have that kind of patience. So I'm going to just talk about the nine weeks that I spent traveling last summer in the wilderness. Wilderness, some of you will say. Where could you ever find anything like that in our day and age? Anyway, I think a story should be a personal thing. Not just an account of one day after the next and I put my boots on and my socks dried out. Those are all the facts. Life is what happens between the facts. I finally understand that. If I were gonna start, it'd be like a reverie. Yourself, I think you come closer to the land and come closer to the animals. It's sort of a melding with the environment around you. Here, you're drawn out of yourself. Your eye wanders to distances, looks for the details. Your spirit soaks in all the experiences. I am on my own, but there isn't someone here to pull me out of a rough spot if I get into one. I'll have to rely on myself in all the situations I come across. But there's a funny dividing line. I, I felt it yesterday when I arrived here and was actually left on my own. I didn't feel bad. Very deep down, I didn't feel the isolation and loneliness. I think I just felt more comfortable coming to the back river, being dropped in the middle of nowhere and left. We'll see if that holds up. Can you hear the sound of the ice? It's uh, thousands of little fragments among bigger, bigger fragments. And the Inuit believe that the ice talks to you. It's like being in a rapid or a waterfall, too. They listen long enough, you do begin to hear voices. Ever since finding the journal of Captain George Back of the Royal Navy in a Boston library, I've wanted to go on this trip, retracing his pioneering route to the Arctic Ocean. The Back River runs for 700 miles through the uninhabited tundra of Canada's Northwest Territory. At the beginning, the river is a growing and gathering river, full of shallow rapids with streams and other rivers feeding into it. The middle section of the river is a series of huge open lakes that, according to Captain Back, are very embarrassing to the navigator. Not even a compass works because you're too close to the magnetic North Pole. And then from his descriptions of the last third of the river, the rapids, one after the other after the other, are each bigger than the last. The journal that I'm going to keep this summer is on film. At the beginning and at the end, for a few days, I'll have the assistance of a film crew. But everything in between will rely on what I do. 
I have to be at the end of the river on the day I've told the plane to meet me because the short Arctic summer from June through August will be over and there's no way for me to get out except by being met. I probably won't see another person during the nine weeks I'm out. Even the few Eskimos or Inuit who once lived in these barren lands are gone now. It's so vast. It's like the deepest breath you can imagine. Then the largest exhale that could be. It's a beautiful open land. So elemental. There's just the sky, the water, and this thin strip of land around you. It's not high, it's all flat. And the rocks that are the Earth's bones are coming right up through the surface. It's truly a landscape where you're in touch with bigger forces than yourself. I feel very lucky to be actually doing the trip and not just dreaming about it. Perhaps the hardest step in the whole journey was deciding that this was exactly what I was going to do. Well, my parents have never been very excited that I go on these trips because they never know if I'll come back. When I left home, my father was desperately ill. He'd had a major operation on his aorta. He could barely move. And before the operation, he'd been a solid, upstanding curmudgeon that he is. Okay. Um, yeah. For me, the idea of his dying is very hard, but also the idea of myself becoming my own person equally hard. <laughs> what are they made of ash? Well, that's a sassafras paddle, actually. It's a very lightweight and flexible. There's a very subtle difference in the attitude between myself and my father and our interpretation of the risk that I'm undertaking. There's so many different kinds of survival. He sees the very palpable risks that I'm letting myself in for by going off on my own for eight weeks. The river could uh, swamp the canoe, I could break my leg in the tundra, I could run out of food, or any other number of little things anybody can think of could happen. But what he doesn't perceive, perhaps, are the tragedies that surround us here of people who are caught in situations that they don't really like, and being sort of sawed away at or chipped away at through the daily activity of pursuits that aren't making them greater, better, or happier. Very nice. Well, it'll be fun to go with you, Robbie. Well, I'll be thinking of you. I went to New York because I was trying to please him. I wasn't trying to please myself. So that by doing this trip, I was taking the boldest step towards my own life that I'd ever taken. The wind will get under it. Way she goes. Well, it's going to be like Dorothy, you know, I'll get to an interesting place. <laughs> I got to hear. Bye. Bye. Good luck. Oh. Have a wonderful trip. Bye. 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 Goodbye, darling. We'll be in touch before we start off. I've never kissed my father in my life, nor has he ever expected it. But I did feel moved to kiss him goodbye when I left. Bye. 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 His cheek felt very sweaty and very cold. And that day he must have been under a great deal of physical pain. And it must have been hard on him, knowing he wasn't feeling too well and seeing his eldest son go off on what he considered another mission. And I think a little bit of distance helps to give a perspective to uh, relationships of all kinds. I'll certainly have that. Oh, I'm out in the middle. Back it up. Any sound I hear indicates a rapid ahead of me. I always have a checklist of things I need to do as I come into a rapid and things that might happen to me. 
I always consider that I might tip over in the rapid, I might punch a hole in the canoe, I might get stuck on a rock in the middle of the river, I might have to portage. Licking my lips because of an itchy beard might make me feel better, but it doesn't really help. The first 20 days of my trip was uh, the first upper part of the river. And the river was narrow, and there were a great many rocks. So I was often getting my canoe stuck, or getting myself stuck, in these rock patches, maybe 100 yards away from the shore. So I'd have to take a portage and dance from rock to rock to get to the shore, knowing if I fell in between, I'd go down into a hole. It was also my first days of living in that twilight, and I found that that evening light was when I wanted to paddle. I'd take the day off during the hot part, and then I'd start at 6 and travel till 2 or 3 in the morning. As that evening light comes on, a lot of the animals come down to the river. They feel more comfortable in that light, that twilight. It's a very peaceful time of day, magical time of day. And at twilight, and the light seemed to be balanced between the sunset and the sunrise and the moon. And I could just feel this singing back and forth between the balance of the world that they all represented. It was quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And I was quiet. And it was like I wasn't there except for my eyes. lake into Regan Lake and when I got to the right place there was a loom right at the entrance it's right over there that was the most fantastic thing I ever saw I think the loon is, is going to be my guide this summer I do I do it's the end of a fine day I've been able to make some miles and get into a uh, little bit of a rhythm. I'm watching that rock up there on the point. And what's nice about it is I'm in a narrows between uh, two lakes and uh, nobody knows their name. Nobody has a name for them that we know. It's really nice to be somewhere that doesn't have a name, doesn't have a purpose other than being itself. My going to New York was my attempt to live the great American dream. I had fallen in love with a beautiful woman, and part of her family's requests of me was that I get a uh, responsible job, make a lot of money, and be a provider. Now, I'd always, prior to that, been involved in the arts. And being in the arts, financial gain is not part of the equation. So I, for my love of this woman, gave up a lot of those former interests to try to please her and please her family. But it was also to please myself, a piece of me that was a lot like my dad, where going into the business community, and not in a service business, but business, was a very important part of 
what America had been built on and what it was all about. And I got an excellent job with an insurance company in New York, and I went to uh, prove to myself I could do it and to win the love of my life. And unfortunately for me, uh, within two months of our arrival there, she mentioned that she had to go home, pick up a few things. And she didn't mention is that she wasn't going to come back. So I wound up in New York with the great job, 12 hours a day, but without the reason that I had said I was there for. I saw a small herd of caribou. I was able to hunker down among the rocks just above the water. I sat and watched them as though I were a blade of grass because I blended in enough to their world. They just went right on by. smart myself today. No bad weather kept up and the wind kept getting uh, stronger. And I moved my tent off the ridge where I had a nice level ground, but it was directly in the eye of the wind. I have nothing but good things to say about how it stood up. But I moved it down here off the ridge and uh, I'm <laughs> now going to uh, start to market something which ought to be a big hit at home for those who like to travel in the tundra but perhaps don't get out here. And that's going to be tundra waterbeds. I have a feeling that where I have pitched my tent has a lot of water under it. I hope that it'll stay down there and not come out and inundate me. Rain, rain, rain. We have another day of it. I'm in the tent early, it's only about 8.30. And I haven't been able to make too many miles because of this rain. But I was lying like this last night and it had stopped raining for a while. And I thought I heard outside the tent someone trying to make a poor imitation of a wolf call. And I thought about how uh, loons' calls can sometimes be mistaken for wolves. But the longer I listened, I realized I was hearing a wolf And it was something about how the sound wrapped around that landscape, including the tent I was in, and wrapping around me. That just let me know, this is the person whose land it is. I am a visitor here. I'm a guest. And the wolf, I doubted, would come through my tent wall, but the wall of that tent is as thin as a piece of paper. But this landscape and the tundra is so big and immense it's so indifferent to our lives that many people can't deal with it. It scares them. And that night I heard the wolf, it scared me. And I understood that maybe it's people's fear in that land that they have to focus on an animal and they focus on a bear and they focus it on the wolf so that they feel that they actually, if they can shoot the bear or shoot the wolf, one point for the human side that diminishes that fear of this landscape. But I think it's really the land they're afraid of. There are the things that you fear that you can see and things that you fear that you can't see. Like the wolf, yesterday I could see him and I did feel it. It started here and it went right up through my head, the fear. But the wind is something you can't see. And I fear that, probably more than an animal. You only see the wind where it touches something. But it could do me a lot of harm by holding me up or tipping me some way or over. 
or ruining my equipment, taking it away. Anyway, as you can see, maybe there are white caps out there, real curlers coming in. And that's uh, not good for me. I can't, uh, can't go any further today because of this uh, wind. And I'm a little annoyed because, I'm damned annoyed because of the wind. It's been five days since I've been uh, able to go forward. And uh, I stopped today because I'm mad. Actually, I have nothing to be angry about, I was thinking earlier, but I am furious uh, with the wind. I thought of a headwind would be a problem at some point, but I never thought that it would be a uh, problem at the beginning of the trip, where I spent uh, six days and haven't moved very far at all. That's a great concern, because it chews up all the days that I'd have as a cushion between me and the end. So you get to see that it's not... Uh, all the planning you do, but it's sort of how you adjust to the things which happen. Uh, <sighs> Before I entered the narrows here, I saw a caribou. I was able to get very close to him coming across the water. And uh, I got so close, I had a picture of him. And then he finally stood up, and I got a, another picture of him. I didn't realize until a little later that the reason he was so slow was he was lame. And that really made me sad. Not that I disturbed him, but that he would soon uh, fall prey to a wolf or some other animal. And uh, there's no going to the doctor for him. This land is so open. It's so clear. Here, you cannot hide from death. What moved me so much over the summer was to begin to see that it wasn't something that I should push away from me. Like uh, we could be in Scotland or Ireland out on the moors. And the rocks look like uh, they're pieces of someone's gigantic game that they've uh, had in a big bag and someone poked a hole in the bag and the rocks are just scattered over the sides of the river and up on the hills. I found myself fascinated with the endless variety of the shapes and positions of the rocks. You have to realize that this is a land made of rock. This is not deep soil, this is the Precambrian shield, and these rocks are the tears or the pebbles fallen off of this huge, massive upswelling of solid rock. Rocks have a presence and an individuality that the longer you spend with them, the more you feel. The pointed one, the flat, heavy one, like notes on a score of someone's fantastic symphony. It helps evoke the mystery and the wonder of this place, it really does. background, it seemed to me a good idea to try and put it to use today. So uh, we've got a big lake to go down, and uh, here we go, a little sand. And now we're clipping along. It wasn't it Ratty and Mole who said that there was nothing nicer than messing around in boats? Don't 
I finally made it to the bottom of uh, Beachy Lake. When the black flies were so thick at the uh, rapids below Beachy Lake, I'm encouraged to keep right on moving. This is the longest portage of the summer, two miles. I had a 50 mile day yesterday and uh, I uh, wonder how far I'll get tonight. Let's see. I don't know. Who goes next? I don't like black flies. I don't like them at all. I've tried. On my way back here. This little guy I found on the path and he didn't make it. One of the little ones who makes the whole tundra come alive. It's a little tiny bird in such a big space. And the second thing that happened was I was coming back along by the river where the rapids are and there was the sun behind them and it was like columns of mist rising. And I looked closer and they are not mist, they are columns of bugs. Not just any bug, black fly. I just want you to know that the wind died and that these are not extras. The wind died. Now I'm getting out of here. That's why I'm here. Bugs or no bugs. That is the rapid at the end of Beachy Lake. And boy, that's the end of the portage. And it's a beautiful piece of water. It really is. I'm coming through a rapid now that if I stay to the right, I'll be fine. Right on the right shore. If I don't, at the end, there's a huge standing wave that'll uh, make a submarine out of me. Here it comes. And the idea is to keep the bow headed downstream the right of the current as it builds up towards the end. Don't get any money. That's it. I, I mean, that was, that's one hit. Got another hit on my right side, boy. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Oh, Looney. I, uh, it's up. I was through, but I'm not. Here's another little round. No rapid. Uh, every rapid is a tough fit. Anyone can sink it. And this is what I'm about to find out here. What the hell's going on? It's a big drop. I think I can see my way through right down here. Oh. thing that I like a lot about this is you can't learn it very well out of a book. I was really rapid yesterday and I got caught in a rock and I clearly started doing pinwheels and I sat there waiting for the next thing to happen and that was wrong. I really got mad at myself because I should get out of that canoe as soon as it was stopped and stuck on that rock. Ooh. This is uh, day 37. Last night I had a nightmare about my father. I woke up and had, I don't know, flung myself or something across the tent. And the dream was this, that I was up in a tree, I think a fir tree. But then I looked down and I could see him in the water and he was in a uh, small little boat that was definitely too small for his big body. And he was sculling and he was going away from me. His, his legs crooked out to the side and his back sculling like this. And he was wearing one of those hospital pajamas, the kind I saw him in when I went to see him. And then the, uh, the boat swamped, and he was in the water, and his limbs were not 
able to keep him up. You could see he was just sinking. That's when I started to jump out of the tree into the water. And his face was the last thing that I could see. It was tilted up his chin. His lips were back, and he was just trying to keep something above water. And uh, that's when I woke up. Great game if you don't weaken. I have tonight a letter from a friend of mine who uh, wrote me a letter before I left. And it's from James Merrill. And Jim wrote this. It says, Contents, mini poems. Let's we'll see what it says. Unbeached canoe, emptied this evening of the stuff of survival, for whom does it dance? Oh, <laughs> what a good question. It dances for the river for all. Oh, I'll have to think about that for a while. What a great thought. Emptied this evening of the stuff of survival, for whom does it dance? One thing I like a lot up here is my shadow. I see it all the time, and it's my only friend. There's time. It helps show me that I'm here, and going forward, and I exist. of the Great Lakes now, and I've got to be very careful about moving uh, into this body of water. There'll be bigger stretches of open water that I'll have to cross more than I've had to so far. But uh, I think we'll make it. This is the 39th day of the trip. This is nuts. I got a camp. I also got lost this morning trying to get into here because of the sand and the current and the bigness of the scale of this thing. I and the lowness of the land, I mean, it runs from, it's flat, and you can't see what the map means. But the waves here aren't so flat. Oh boy, I gotta, I gotta go. Here was a place where I was windbound several days, and he kept going back and forth, back and forth, 30 yards away from my tent. So I got intrigued with trying to see if I could invite him in to have a meal. It wasn't that tough. Well, yesterday was an interesting day. I finally got myself off uh, from the windbound that I'd been and back in the canoe, but on the big lakes. And they make me nervous. I really don't like them. And anxious. Some people don't like roast beef. I just don't like being in a high following sea on a big lake in a small canoe. So I had to do it a different way I, and I thought about it in terms of one stroke at a time. And I just did that and I just looked at the environment right around me and tried to see the nice things in the water there. And after an hour or so then 
I remembered something that really moved me, which was going to visit my dad in the hospital after he'd had his operation. And I watched him uh, get out of his bed and move across the hospital floor, maybe no longer than 20 feet. It took him 10 minutes, and he didn't want any help. And there was an incredible amount of perseverance in that. And I figured that if he could do that, <laughs> this stuff is a piece of cake. This is the mission of uh, Father Bulliard that uh, is on an island in the middle of Gary Lake. Beautiful lake. If I were here and this were my mission, I'd feel very close to God. He was ministering to the last of the Inuit who lived in this area. He was getting very old. And in uh, 53, he came back here for one more season and was never seen again. As far as my own religion goes, I'd say I'm a backsliding Unitarian. I uh, am all for religions that respect the rights of animals and nature, and I'm not much in favor of religions that assume man has dominance over all the animals and the earth. You might call me a blue domer. Blue uh, vault of the sky is the top of my church. I've done it. I'm lost. I uh, came across from uh, one side of this lake to the other. You couldn't see it sort of over the edge of the horizon. And I've either gone too high or too low. And I've been back and forth a few times. And I am, as Horace Kephart would say, confused. He makes a distinction between being lost and confused. If you're lost, ain't nobody ever going to help you. But if you're confused, you can help yourself. But this has brought it home to me that uh, I am very much alone in uh, things like this bribe, uh, drive that home. I'm lost in the middle of the big lake, and I'm trying to find out where exactly I am. And I came across this peregrine uh, falcon nest, and it's beautiful. There's a little snow white chick down there. Mom and Dad don't like it much, but then uh, I won't be here very long. When you think about it, you get security from three basic things. Knowing who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. I have two out of the three, so today I hope to solve the third. It's the uh, 46th day of the trip, and uh, I set out this morning not knowing where I was, and I now know where I am, and it was a, an interesting day. I was looking for what I was calling the Big Island, an island which I had uh, on the map seen. And I couldn't find it on the horizon, and I paddled this morning two hours in the direction that it should have been. Then I realized I could see it was just not up that way, so I came back. This is where I camped last night. Uh, not now, not here. Uh -huh. The punchline is that looking for the island, I was actually standing on it. I was even camping on it last night, the one that I was looking for. Oh, boy. So I feel really foolish, and I almost did myself in with the amount of waves. It's very heavy wind today, a very strong wind. Uh 
Well, I paddled last night. I got here late as I leave the big lakes and go into the next and last section of the journey. And I had an amazing paddle from 7 to 12. It was dark by the time I got here. But uh, I saw something, not outside of me, but inside of me. And I'd seen that peregrine falcon's nest. And I had seen that little chick inside of the nest. And I began to think about the nest and that peregrine. When I saw that nest, I was lost. And that feeling of being lost is as far away from home and a nest as you can be. It's strange because even the peregrine's uh, nest looks so precarious. I mean, the littler nests I'd seen earlier in the summer were very precarious. A footstep or any number of animals, it would seem, could find them. When you think about it, a nest is such a symbol of security and centeredness and it's such a confident gesture in this world to build a nest. And I remembered my home and the time in my life when our house was intact, the kids lived upstairs. That memory of that never attainable again intimacy it kind of wrapped something up for me in my life. But that nest now is inside me. Not only the peregrine's nest, but the nest of those years that we had on that third floor, the feeling of well-being can be mine if I wish it. You could even extend it to say that the world is our nest. We share it with a lot of other creatures and things, but the world is like a nest. That's how we should treat it. Hi. Now I'm looking forward to this last sort of third of the trip in a way. Um, I'm very relieved to be here. I've finally gotten over those lakes. Boy, am I happy about that. And I wonder what's going to be in store in the next third. Everything is wet. Absolutely everything. I am drenched and soaked. It's just awful. I had to get up at 4 o'clock because the wind had done a 180 degree shift. And uh, it was blowing on the side of the tent and it was knocking it down. So I've spent since around 4 o'clock till around now, it's just 9 o'clock, moving my camp to, I found one little spot that was all right. And um, that was about a mile away from where I was before. But geez, it is a gale out there. It is a gale. And that makes me nervous because I got 200 miles to go. And I got about 10 days to do it in. And I've got some of the uh, biggest rapids and some of the longest paddling. I don't know. What the hell? Um, One bright note in the storm was that I opened up an envelope from a friend of mine, and look what I got. <laughs> Not one, but quite a few pinups. <laughs> really great. And the wind and stuff has abated a little bit, and I'm going to... Uh, go out today and get uh, noon anyway. Ooh. Oh, this is a chicken vest. And you better believe that's what I am. The weather is as cold as it is. And I've got rapids to shoot if I fall in. They say you've got about 10 minutes. This might give me an extra three. <clears throat> well, I'm happy to have it. But my mood yesterday Oh, God, and my dreams last night were just awful. I was, uh, I think, really affected by that storm and wind. All I could think of were the things that I've never done, the people I've done things bad to, uh, all the stuff in my father and myself that's still unresolved. Just a lot of things that uh, <laughs> don't make you feel good, things that are just stuff that 
can't deal with all the time. Now, these are the toughest rapids in the world. You've got waterfalls in them to shoot. You've got rock dodging, like a slalom in a ski course. You have to maneuver the canoe in, out, towards the middle, right up tight on the shore. And you have to be able to perceive in the water what's under it. the tundra do to help you develop your humility and the tundra does it by showing you things it doesn't do it by telling you things and what it's shown me is how much I fail to notice all the things that I have not seen are what hold me back or limit me and the uh, tundra is really fine at showing you what you fail to notice and that's when you can actually maybe start to see things is when you realize that you do fail to notice. There's an Irish myth about the son of a father who's dying who goes on a quest to find something that will cure the father, an elixir. And he does. He finds it uh, through trial and through great trials and tribulations. But I think I have it. And I think what it is is understanding. I've, that's the elixir. And the elixir is really more for me so that I can understand that he's going on the journey that he's on. And I'm on my own journey. And <clears throat> understanding that allows me to let him go if I need to, if he dies, but that it's uh, part of life, that it's all right, and this is a gift that the trip has given me, and I just hope I get to be able to get home in time, not even necessarily to say it, but just to show them that I do understand. And I've come to see that what he's doing, he was not against me. He was just truly expressing his love for me through the ways he, that had worked for him. Had I gone into investment banking or something like that, he'd have been able to help me and I would have understood how to be proud for someone doing that. I have a better understanding of who he is and who I am and that we're different branches off the same tree. You could point to the map and say, that's what I did. But is that really what I did? Really? I think there's been a whole other journey that overrides the physical one. That truly is the journey. It's the daydreams that I've had while I've paddled. It's the meetings that I've had along the way with the wolf, with the bear, with the peregrine, with the little sparrow, with the fish, with the bugs with the sunlight, with the rocks, with the little flowers. The thousand incidents that you could put on a string like that popcorn for your Christmas tree when you were a kid, each of those would be the journey. They have given me so much more than I set out to find. In order to deserve their trust, I had to greet them as equals and listen very hard to their quiet voices. The weather changed. That was the first indication that uh, I'd best be on my way. It got colder, it started to rain. Also though, I could see in the tundra the change in the landscape. The greens, the hundreds of different shades of greens were now turning to browns 
and some of the little berries that are on the tundra turning bright red. The nests of the birds that I had been watching so carefully all summer were now abandoned. The snow started sounding like a thousand needles breaking on the tent fabric, and I didn't have warm enough sleeping bag or clothes to keep me warm. That's it, it's over. God, we're here. Oh, I don't believe it. <laughs> oh, one happy guy. Oh, well, I'd like to thank, uh, I really would. I'd like to thank the river. I'd like to thank the animals. And I'd like to thank the rock for giving me this marvelous journey. And I think of my dad. And I hope uh, that his summer has had a success as successful a conclusion as mine has been. Not always easy, but that's it. Oh, yeah, one other thing. Maybe I should try out my bear protector to see whether it works or not. That would be... See whether I would have been protected from all those bears.
For more information and to order copies of this film, visit our website at gotrob.com. I finally made it to the bottom of uh, Beachy Lake when the black flies were so thick at the uh, rapids below Beachy Lake I'm encouraged to keep right on moving. This is the longest portage of the summer, two miles. I had a 50 mile day yesterday and uh, I uh, wonder how far I'll get tonight. Let's see. I don't know. Who goes next? I don't like black flies. I don't like them at all. I've tried. On my way back here. This little guy I found on the path and he didn't make it. One of the little ones who makes the whole tundra come alive. It's a little tiny bird in such a big space. And the second thing that happened was I was coming back along by the river where the rapids are and there was the sun behind them and it was like columns of mist rising. And I looked closer and they are not mist, they are columns of bugs. Not just any bug, black flies. I just want you to know that the wind died and that these are not extras. The wind died. Now I'm getting out of here. That's why I'm here. Bugs or no bugs. That is the rapid at the end of Beachy Lake. And boy, that's the end of the portage. And it's a beautiful piece of water. It really is. I mean, how do you ever really know something? By coming and spending six weeks in Kimchaka, do I know really anything about it? It went way beyond just the opportunity of being the first Americans to travel there. People at home will think I know something about Kamchatka, but I won't, really. But there are parts that I do know about. The idea started innocently enough. A canoe trip in Kamchatka, I really I wanted to try and catch one of those Siberian blue trout. Today we're on second day on the river, and to all of us, it's very difficult. Today with Robert, we went on a scouting mission. We checked the river for a kilometer downstream. Today we'll have some big difficulties. We're calling this the river from hell. But we do like it, right? <laughs> I do, I like it. Okay. You got mosquitoes all over <laughs> you. Please. Oh yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay. He didn't seem too upset about leaving the canoes behind and climbing into a helicopter. He said, "Okay, Rob, it's my turn to broaden your horizons. You've got to see the volcanoes. That's really Kamchatka." Vasily wasn't satisfied just to look. He asked a volcanologist to climb with us up Avacha, the second highest volcano in the neighborhood. I wondered if it would become the volcano from hell.
Water is the element I feel closest to. I don't know why. Maybe because the river remains one thing that knows nothing about time. Meanders and oxbows still exist. But who ever knows a river? You can't hold it like a stick. The Connecticut is not the blue line on the map. It is a whole system of living water. 148 tributaries flow into it, draining an area of 11,000 square miles. Ben is a wildlife rehabilitator, now surrogate mother to these two cubs. He was asked to raise them because they had been abandoned by their mother. Last year was a bad one for nuts and berries, and the mother was too thin to raise the cubs herself. Where you started from? Uh, the Canadian border. Damn! How many days you been out here doing this shit? One month. A month? Yeah. Damn! I admire somebody like you, man. <laughs> <laughs> One in the morning. There's a full moon that's over there. The sun is just set over there. It's gonna move around and come up over here. And it's never gonna get dark. I love paddling at night. It's like dreaming after a couple of hours of paddling. You feel like you're in a dream. But if you have to take a life to eat, oh, then you revere it. And I lost my f knife. I can't believe it. Oh, I don't believe it. Foolish man. Foolish man. Oh, my knife from Siberia. I lost that little knife. So people ask you what kind of rapids there are up here, and they class rapids in canoeing terms one to five. And I always think it's sort of a silly thing, because if you tip over in a one, that's a five to you. I wanted to go because John Muir's been my childhood hero, a 19th century Scotsman who changed our view of nature. Sam said he'd come if he didn't have to navigate. Now, do you know who John Muir was? Did you ever hear his name? John D Muir? Muir. I've heard the name. I used to work for uh, um, Sue Hubbard. You ever heard of her? No, you don't have to press the thing. Oh. It's doing it while we. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah, you hold it. So, that's right. All right. Cut it like that. Okay. And then I take a bite. Okay. Mm. Ah, you got it upside down. What the hamburger? Mm. What do you mean upside down? Well, the. Oh, you mean it should be yeah, this should way? Yeah. There now. <laughs> Now, 
I needed a partner and we arranged to meet at the symbol of African adventure, Victoria Falls. Bonus Lunga is 27 and from a small village in Zimbabwe. We are both experienced rivermen. Bonus guides tourists dodging hippos and crocs on the flat water of the Zambezi. I travel the lonely, wild rivers of the Arctic. Ahead of us lies a thousand miles and a ten-week journey. This is the end of the Limpopo River. I love saying its name, Limpopo, always have. Kipling's story brought me here, but it's bonus and this river of people who've pulled me back.